As you get settled, let me encourage you to take a Bible and open it with me to the book of Isaiah, near the center of our Bibles, back to Isaiah chapter 64. If you didn't bring a Bible with you, there should be one hopefully very close to you beneath the row of chairs in front of you. And if you're using one of those pew Bibles, Isaiah 64 is on page number 623. We would love it if you would open up a Bible and be ready to read with us. Thank you so much for being here this morning, for so enthusiastically singing out, for the good prayers that have been offered already today. We have been blessed with a beautiful morning, and we're glad that you're here. We've been looking forward to today. As Paul mentioned, we've been announcing that we want to focus ourselves on a a very practical goal. That if the Lord wills, we could devote ourselves as individuals and as a body of believers to making the next 32 days, days of fervent prayer. That we would devote ourselves and our hearts and that we would lift up our souls to our Creator in fervent, heartfelt prayer over the course of the next 32 days. I'll have more to say about that toward the end of our time, but we want to spend the next few minutes just in asking why, in laying a foundation as to why we are making this our goal throughout the month of October. You've got our Bibles, your Bibles open there to Isaiah 64, many, many of us naturally think about the greatness of God in terms of His infinite power and might, the the creative force that He has exerted around the universe, on this planet that we are sitting this morning, and we think about Him as the Creator, we think about Him as the Sustainer, and that leads us to, okay, many, many passages that manifest His greatness in terms of, I am God, I am the Creator, I am your ultimate source and the source of everything that you see, as the created, as the ones in need of air and warmth and light and energy, you serve me. And of course, as the Creator, He has every right to do that. We have many passages of Scripture that define Him as the Creator, that record His words putting everything into perspective and calling for us to serve Him. Isaiah 64 and verse 8 is a good example. Now, O Lord, the prophet Isaiah says, You are our Father. We are the clay. You are our potter. We are all the work of Your hand. Undoubtedly, one of the ways that God manifests His greatness is in declaring Himself to be the potter and we the clay and encouraging us to yield ourselves to His molding. But could I encourage you this morning to consider another dimension of His greatness? And we don't have to go far to find this second aspect of His creation. It's right there in Isaiah 64. Just a few verses before verse 8. Isaiah 64 and verse 4. Here is the exclamation. From of old, no one has heard or perceived by the ear. No eye has seen a God besides you who acts for those who wait for Him. Now that is something entirely different, isn't it? It is one thing for God to declare His greatness by defining Himself as the great eternal creative potter. 
and telling us that we are the clay and as the clay, we ought not to harden ourselves and rebel against the capable hands of the potter. I am the Creator. Obey Me. I am the Sustainer. Live life in the way that I have defined and declared and and revealed as my vision and my will for you. He has every right to do that. And when we hear that language and think of those terms, we think greatness. But this is also a manifestation of of the greatness of God. There is no God like this God. No eye has seen a God like this. A God who acts for those who wait for Him. And this is a common thread all over the Bible. Old and New Testaments. In the New Testament book of Acts, chapter 17 and verse 24, Paul says, The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is He served by human hands as though He needed anything, since He Himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. He not only demands, He gives. And that is a sign of His wonderful greatness. In the Gospel of Mark, chapter 10 and verse 45, God's own Son describes Himself as the Son of Man who came not to be served, but to serve. This God not only expects to be served, He is willing to serve. And the greatest manifestation of that is that God's own Son gave His life as a ransom for all. In the Old Testament book of Second Chronicles, chapter 16 and verse 9, the eyes of this Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to give support. His eyes not only see everything, His ears not only hear everything, His mind is not only aware of everything, but He is there to give strong support to those whose heart is blameless toward Him. One aspect of His greatness is I am God, serve me. And that is a strain throughout the Bible. It is no wonder that Peter and Paul and James and John and others repeatedly describe themselves as servants of the Lord. But listen, also this is a dimension of His matchless greatness. He is there to provide strong support to those whose heart is blameless toward Him. This God does not need to hang a sign outside of His door asking for help, advertising help wanted. But what He is doing, even this very morning, is communicating to all who are willing to listen Strong help is available. One very special way that that relates to us this morning is the God-given gift of prayer. Would you listen with me to Paul in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 4 where he tells Christians, encourages Christians, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. This morning, He has not held out a sign that says, 
help wanted or help needed. What He is holding forth to anyone willing to listen is strong help available. Peter, who walked for three years with the Lord, encouraged disciples, you humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God. His hand unmistakably is mighty. It can do whatever it is that He wants it to do. No purpose of the Lord can be thwarted. But if we will humble ourselves under the mighty hand that is able to squash every one of us in a moment, if we will humble ourselves under that mighty hand, at the proper time, He will exalt us. Not help wanted, strong help available. Cast all of your anxieties on Him because He cares for you. Turn in your Bibles with me to the book of Romans chapter 10, if you will. Let's talk just for a moment about the basics. When we talk about prayer, when God speaks of prayer, He's not merely speaking of something involving our human wishes. Prayer is not simply wishing for something or thinking about something or reciting some memorized words with an unengaged heart. Prayer is the act of communicating our human thoughts to the infinite mind of God. Prayer is the act of communicating our human thoughts to the infinite mind of God. It unmistakably involves our hearts. Paul says of those fellow Jews in Romans chapter 10 and verse 1, Brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God for them is that they may be saved. This is something that I feel in my heart and I am engaging my heart and I am communicating the wishes and the desires and the thoughts of my heart to the infinite mind of God. Throughout His written revelation to mankind, God presents Himself as the God who hears the prayers of His people. Psalm 3 and verse 3, You, O Lord, are a shield about me, my glory and the lifter of my head. I cried aloud to the Lord, And He answered me from His holy hill. Psalm 18 and verse 6, In my distress, I called upon the Lord to my God. I cried for help. From His temple, He heard my voice and my cry to Him reached His ears. Psalm 34 and verse 4, I sought the Lord and He answered me and delivered me from all my fears. Those who look to Him are radiant and their faces shall never be ashamed. This poor man cried and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear Him and delivers them. Throughout the Bible, God presents Himself as a God who hears. In the language of Psalm 34 and verse 15, the eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous. And His ears are open toward their cry. Which introduces a very important element into our understanding of prayer. Anyone can wish. Anyone can think. Anyone can express desire. God Himself has said, My ears are open to the cries of the righteous. While the eyes and the ears of the Lord are receptive to the righteous, iniquities... Create a separation. Sins hide. 
the holy face of God from those created in His image. In the language of Isaiah 59 and verse 1, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save. His ear is not dull that it cannot hear. The problem is my iniquities have made a separation between me and my God. And my sins have hidden His face from me so that He does not hear. Which means our greatest need this morning is Jesus. Your greatest need this morning is not food. It is not clothing. It is not shelter. It is not light. It is not warmth. It is not human companionship. It is not anything else in all of creation. Our greatest need, if God's ears are open to the righteous, if sins create a separation so that He will not hear, our greatest need, is Jesus. In John chapter 1 and verse 9, the true light which gives light to everyone was coming into the world in the form of God's own Son, Jesus Christ. He was in the world, John tells us, and the world was made through Him, yet the world did not know Him. He came to His own and His own people did not receive Him. But to all who did receive Him, who believed in His name, He gave the right to become children of God who were born not of blood. We're not talking about simply a physical birth here. We're not talking about something that I or you as human beings can will for ourselves. This birth, this new birth as it is described in John chapter 3, is accomplished according to the will of God. When people heard good news of forgiveness and reconciliation, purpose in the sight of God, despite the fact that they had sinned against Him, they were moved to ask in Acts chapter 2, what shall we do? And Peter connects their greatest need to Jesus. He connects the answer of the greatest dilemma to Jesus. Repent. Turn away from the sins that have created this separation between you and God. Be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. What is accomplished when I answer that invitation call of the Gospel? Paul in Romans chapter 6 says, Don't you know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into His death? We were buried therefore with Him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life no longer experiencing this separation between our sinful selves and the holy God who has created all of these things. No, if I have been baptized and united with Christ, the Spirit bears witness with my spirit that I am a child of God. It is this glorious truth that moves John to write, see what kind of love the Father has given us that we should be called children of God. And let me ask you something this morning. How did Jesus teach children of God to pray? Our Father in heaven. Throughout His written revelation to mankind, God presents Himself as a God who hears. His ears and His eyes are receptive to the righteous. Here's the problem. Not one of us in and of ourselves is righteous. We choose to sin. 
We choose to commit iniquity that creates a separation between ourselves and the God who has promised to hear, which means our greatest need is Jesus, who died for our sins that we might put to death the old man or woman of sin, be buried with Christ in baptism, and be raised to walk as newly recreated children of God. No greater manifestation of God's love than that. And when we are followers, students of, when we have dedicated our lives to living of Christ sort of lives, He teaches us to pray. And to pray like this. Our Father in heaven. Could I speak for a moment to those of us who are children of God? And could I encourage all of us to realize this morning at the beginning of this new God-given week that prayerlessness on the part of a child of God is a form of childish selfishness. From a practical point of view, the things I pray about are the things I trust God to handle. The things I neglect to pray about, those are the things... I feel pretty good about handling on my own. There are several in this room, undoubtedly, who are on the brink of giving up. Could I ask you, have you prayed about that? From a practical point of view, the things I pray about are the things I trust God to handle. The things I neglect to pray about are the things I trust I can handle on my own. And if I believe that prayer works, if I believe there is a God who hears, if I believe prayer is a means through which the Lord acts, if I believe that God chooses to work through prayer in powerful ways, if I believe that prayer is one of the ways that God can work in ways that I simply cannot work, is it not selfish of me not to pray? Herein lies the danger of treating prayer as supplemental. I'll pray if things get out of my control rather than fundamental. This is a part of who I am. I need thee every hour. If in all honesty this morning my prayers are meager, let's realize that meager prayers come from men and women who believe they can get along all right without prayer. If I believe that I can get along all right without prayer, I won't pray all that much. Consider the example of Jonah told by God to go to the wicked city of Nineveh and preach good news of forgiveness to them. And he doesn't want to go and he tries to hide and he heads in the other direction on a boat across the mighty Mediterranean Sea. But the Lord, according to Jonah chapter 1 and verse 4, hurled a great wind upon the sea and there was a mighty tempest on the sea so that the ship threatened to break up. Then the mariners were afraid and each cried out to his God and they hurled the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten it for them and the only man on the ship who knew the God who created heaven and earth he's asleep prayerlessness was a form of childish selfishness 
on Jonah's part. Let's not be those sorts of children of God this week or this month. To pray is to love. Not to pray is to be complacent and unloving and selfish. Prayerlessness is selfishness on the part of the preacher who does not pray through the process of preparing to proclaim God's Great word to other people. Prayerlessness is selfishness on the part of a father or a mother who does not daily prayer for his or her children. Prayerlessness is selfishness on the part of a member of a church who does not pray for his brothers and sisters in Christ. Prayerlessness is selfishness on the part of the Christian who does not pray for his or her unbelieving neighbors. Prayerlessness is selfishness on the part of the worshiper who does not pray for his brothers and sisters in Christ who are being persecuted around the world. Let's realize this morning that as we gather this morning without a thought in the, wor- in the world about our safety. There were those seven days ago on a Sunday halfway around the world who exited a building in which they had dedicated themselves to worshiping. And more than a hundred of them were killed by a bomb meant for those professing faith in Jesus Christ. Prayerlessness is a form of childish selfishness. James chapter 5 and verse 16, the prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. I cannot do more than pray after I've prayed. Or I can do more than pray after I've prayed, but I cannot do more than pray until I've prayed. Could we end this morning with seven practical ways to engage our hearts this week? Because if my life is largely being characterized as prayerless, it's an issue of the heart. And so could I center our minds on just some simple statements from God's Word. First of all, delight. Psalm 37 and verse 4, Delight yourself in the Lord, and He will give you the desires of your heart. Could I encourage you to make delight in God a means by which you can engage your heart in prayer? This week. Number two, desires. In Matthew chapter 6 and verse 21, Jesus said, Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Could I encourage you to pray to God? You are the greatest treasure of my heart. Help me align the affections of my heart with yours. Number three, dependence. John chapter 15 and verse 5, Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me you can do nothing. Pray this week. Keep me aware of you as my greatest need. Number four, discernment. Hebrews 5 and verse 14, solid food is for the mature, for those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. Could I encourage you to pray this week? Train me, God, whatever it takes Train me in the fight to love the good and abhor the evil. Number five, desperation. 
Psalm 73, verse 23, Nevertheless, I am continually with you. You hold my right hand. You guide me with your counsel, and afterward you will receive me to glory. Whom have I in heaven but you? And there is nothing on earth that I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Pray this week, God, whatever it takes, would you be the strength my prone to wonder heart so desperately needs. Number six, discipline. Hebrews 12 and verse 10. Our earthly fathers discipline us for a short time as it seems best to them. God disciplines us for our good. That we may share His holiness. And for the moment, all of that discipline seems painful rather than pleasant. But later, later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Pray this week. Engage your heart. I trust you. I trust you to do whatever you must do for my own good. Finally, diligence. 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 58, Christians are called, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. Our Lord has said, be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. Engage your heart this week wholeheartedly, fervently pray. I pledge to faithfully serve you for the rest of my life. What we want to do to help each other over the course of the next month through the last day of October is to provide a simple little tool for every day. You can read this tool in somewhere between 30 and 60 seconds. It contains just a simple scripture for the day, a simple thought for the day, and simple seeds in light of that scripture for the day that can help you pray the way God wants you to pray. If you're already on our news email list as a member here, you don't need to do anything. Lord willing, that will show up in your inbox bright and early tomorrow morning. If you're visiting with us, we're glad that you're here. You'll be able to see each and every one of these posted bright and early every morning on our website. We would encourage you, if you would like to see exactly what we're dedicating ourselves to over the course of the next 32 days, you can see it there. For those of you that aren't online people, we love you too, and we're glad that you're here. We have paper copies of everything that will be handed out or sent out digitally that will be available on the welcome table in the foyer. If you don't receive email or get online, please be sure to get a copy of that. And you will see what we will be focusing on, Lord willing, beginning tomorrow morning, the last day of September. Could I encourage you to dedicate the next 32 days to more fervent, heartfelt prayer than you have ever experienced in a 32-day period? There is nothing that our Heavenly Father is incapable of. And He has told His children, ask, seek, knock. Devote yourself to doing that in fresh, powerful ways over the course of the next 32 days. And if you will do that, then the month of October will be a month of extraordinary growth in your relationship with God. If you do not have a relationship with God this morning, we are so thankful that you're here. And we have already seen from God's Word what step number one ought to be for you this morning. This is the God who hears, 
But sin and iniquity creates a separation between sinners and this amazing God. God has acted by sending His only begotten Son. He died in order that you might be welcomed into God's family. Would you be willing to turn away from sin? Would you be willing by faith to be buried with Christ in baptism so that you might be raised a son or a daughter of God? If there is any way that we could help you this morning, would you let us know how we can help by coming to the front while we stand and sing?